I'm delighted to be back at RSI. Um, I'm totally, uh, well, I don't know, stunned that I have apparently had 50 Rickoids in the lab over the years. It would be really, really embarrassing to try to recall all of their names. Um, it would be reasonably, so there's an interesting difference um, between uh, recall and recognition memory, which you know from all sorts of uh, tests that you took in school, right? Which, which is the easier test, the fill in the blank or, or the multiple choice? Right, okay, multiple choice is recognition memory. Um, fill in the blank is recall memory. So I would totally bomb the recall memory thing. I've got a bad feeling that the multiple choice thing wouldn't go that well either. Um, <laughs> because, you know, that's a lot of people. But anyway, um, but what I do remember uh, is that the very first time I gave an, uh, an RSI lecture, um, I had, um, I, I wasn't sure what to talk about, and so I gave, I decided to just give people a choice, and I tossed up three topics and gave them a choice, um, and that was fine, it went fine. The next year, the problem with RSI is that the people who were uh, you know, here as, as students one year turn out to be the staff the next year, and, and whoever it was said, you are going to give everybody a choice. So um, it has become um, mandatory that I give you a choice. Um, and so I, I, I thought a little bit about that, and um, what I thought I could do, and, 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 I, I, and this will be a little free form. In, in don't worry if you don't get your first choice because the solution to that is when we get around to asking questions, you say, what did you mean when you said in the choice? And we can talk about it later. But as a place to start, um, we could either start with um, uh, a really ugly fish. <laughs> in a minute, we're about to start with my vacation pictures, um, which is OK, too. Um, we could start with a really ugly fish, uh, which I promise you has something to do with, well, and, and, and more generally, the, the, the senses that um, animals have, some of which you do not, many of which, of course, you do, but often in slightly different fashion. So we could start with ugly fish. Um, we could start with um, uh, poking yourself in the eye, um, because it turns out uh, th th this, was a, this is a topic. <laughs> this is a topic that um, I, I conjured up many years ago when I realized I had to give a talk about vision without any uh, audiovisual stuff. I don't remember what the occasion was, but I wasn't going to have a projector. So what am I going to talk about? So it turns out you can do a lot of really interesting visual stuff poking yourself in the eye, not the stupid stuff. You know, <laughs> but um, we, so we, we could do that. Um, as an aside, I would say that. Um, that lecture uh, was one that had uh, signs posted around MIT saying, you know, come here, you know, 10 things you can learn by poking yourself in the eye. And a, uh, an editor thought um, that th this is going to be my ticket and her ticket to fame and fortune, because I'm going to write a book um, with that title, and we're all going to get rich. And uh, so we, we had lunch. Um, Around the time of the glass of water at the beginning, we figured out this was not going to happen because she thought that 10 things you could learn uh, by poking yourself in the eye had to, what was sort of a self-help book. You know, <laughs> if you hurt yourself um, in your relationships, uh, you can get up and learn things from that. And, and when I said, well, I'm talking about like how your retina is put together. Um, we had a perfectly lovely lunch, and then we parted on good terms. Um, so we could talk about that. Um, or it turns out that if, if, you, if, uh, if you're in the publish or perish business, and you live long enough, suggesting that you did not perish, um, you publish quite a lot. And it turns out that this week, I published my 200th peer-reviewed paper. Um, and we could talk about that, um, which I won't even tell you what it's about. That, 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 that's, that's like the, the, you know, the, the, the grab bag 
one. But you can be reasonably assured that it's got something to do with visual perception and, and, and um, visual attention. So it's ugly fish poking yourself in the eye, um, or what in the world was I writing about um, this week? Uh, so how many votes do we have for ugly fish? Yeah, five guys in the back. OK. Uh, <laughs> how many votes do we have for poking yourself in the eye? Well, kind of a lot of votes for that. OK, how many votes for whatever I was writing about this week? You know, there's three guys who want to know about that. Um, all right, so I, I, I think we will start by, by uh, doing the poking yourself in the eye thing then. Um, and I, I, sh I should say I've never been quite sure if 10 was the right number, but we'll see if, we'll, we'll see if we get there. Um, and we'll just leave that sitting there um, with the possibility that I will think of something in my collection of PowerPoint demos that I want to show that's connected with it. Um, all right, so if, you're gonna, if we're going to do that, you actually have to poke yourself in the eye. Um, and, and first you need instructions because otherwise, um, Jenny's going to get like really mad at me for, um, and, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, so um, what you want to do uh, is you. Uh, oh, oh, well, here, 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 let's 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 start with um, why this sounds on the face of it like a stupid thing to do. Why don't you poke yourself in the eye? It's sensitive. It's sensitive. I, 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 Somebody, somebody, I think, said the fairly obvious point. It hurts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 not, a, it, it's not a smart thing to do because the eye is very sensitive, um, and, and, and it hurts. Um, and uh, that's, that's nature's way of telling you that uh, poking yourself in the eye is not really a smart idea. Um, uh, the clear front surface of the eye is the cornea. The cornea is one of the two surfaces in the eye, the two surfaces on the body that are the most sensitive to pain. Um, if you, um, oh, we'll just let that go. Actually, we'll close it because otherwise, so this is, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that's Nikko. If you get a chance to go to Nikko, it's about an hour and a half north of Tokyo. It's great. Um, and, but enough of that. Go away. OK. Um, uh, where were we? Okay, so um, if you, um, <laughs> what the heck? You're a squid. Why is it doing this? I've turned. All right, if it keeps doing this after I unplug it from the machine, you know, don't we really worry? Oh, was that RSI students? Could have been. Anyway. Uh, Cornea, right, cornea. Don't scratch it. Um, little, if, 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 you, if you do scratch your cornea, um, you will be really, really unhappy. You will go to the emergency room. They will drop a dye in your eye um, that, flore that, where, where, that fluoresces um, under the right illumination <clears throat> with a, um, uh, if the tissue is damaged, so that you can see what the damage is and a teeny little scratch will um, be more than enough to send uh, the the bravest and strongest among you um, uh, off to the emergency room. Uh, it it really really is unpleasant. Um, whereas if if you you know fell down on the playground and scratched your knee, you'd go crying to mom. But that's not going to get you to the emergency room, right? Uh, they're they're very different very different uh, sensory surfaces. OK, that's one. I claim that it was one of the two most sensitive surfaces um, on, the, uh, uh, on, on the body to pain. What's the other one? Anybody got a wait, wait, wave, wave a hand? Yeah. Your fingertips? Uh, well, you, yeah, fingertips aren't happy about it. But if you, I mean, it'll make you go, woo. But if I say, if you gave yourself a nice paper cut right now, would that right? But you're not going off to the you're not going off to the emergency room, mostly, right? So yeah, more more sensitive, probably more sensitive than your your knees. That's true. But nope, nope, nope. Any other any other great candidates? Uh, eardrum. eardrum is actually the, the, is, is is the right answer to that. Um, 
so the, the, which is, this is partly why your mother told you not to go sticking pointy things in your ear. Um, the temptation of which is very great at a certain time in your childhood. Um, the eardrum really, really does not want to be touched either. Um, how many people remember when they were little having uh, ear infections? Right? Really, really painful. It's really, really painful because you get fluid buildup in, in, in the middle ear and it, it, it uh, distorts the eardrum and that, that it just doesn't want to, it just doesn't want to happen. Um, so there may be um, 10 things you can learn by poking yourself in the ear, but I'm not an auditory guy. <clears throat> so we'll do the eye. But I'm perfectly well aware that I don't want to scratch anybody's cornea. So here's how you poke your eye. Um, what, what I want you to do is uh, poke. If it hurts, you're poking too hard. If you don't see anything, you're being a wimp. So <laughs> what you want to do is sort of poke way out here by your cheekbone and sort of wiggle your finger around a little bit. Or uh, you can, uh, in the uh, inner corner, the inner canthus, as it's known in the trade, um, will work too. But it's easiest uh, to, to poke yourself in the eye out here. Um, so, how many people see something? Uh, uh, okay, the rest of you need to work on this a little bit, because um, this is not, individual differences are a fascinating thing in, um, in the study of psychology, but this isn't one of the realms where it's really interesting. This is a, if you do it right, you'll see something. So, you know, poke, poke there, but, okay, who wants to tell me something they saw? Yeah, okay, out in the cheap seats. Yeah, yeah, you. Everything was like distorted. Everything was like distorted. Um, distorted in what sense? Let's, uh, we'll, see, we'll, we'll, we'll collect a few of these and see what we can do with them. Uh, what, 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 what's distorted mean in this case? Uh, a bit blurry, perhaps? Uh, oh, a bit blurry. Oh, that's, okay, we'll, we, can, we can work with blurry. Okay. Uh, okay, working in the back still. I was touching my right eye, eye here, and towards like the middle left, I'm seeing like a dark spot. Like okay, uh, a spot. And we already uh, determined that it is located, um, if you, uh, on, uh, you press on, the, uh, uh, on your right eye, it's on the left over by the bridge of your nose, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll label that as like right to left. Okay, what happens if you do your left eye? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Try. That seems unlikely. Where's where's the, where's the spot? Yeah. Okay. Or left to right. It's 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 on it's on the opposite. <clears throat> it's on the opposite side. Um, if you're if you're uh, one of the really cool people, you can try poking around on the bottom and the top and convince yourself that it also flips that way. Yes. If you were to poke like the inside of, say, your right eye, it shows up on the right, and then I assume if you poke it, yeah, if you poke it the inside of your left eye, it shows up on the left. Oh yeah, okay. So we we can we can, um, I, I don't know, we'll cube that or square that or something, right? So if you poke the uh, right side of the right eye, it's on the left. But also if you poke the right side of the left eye. By poking in here, you'll, you'll see the spot over on the left. Yep, that works. Yeah. And then, uh, this is something I've noticed when I was younger. Like, depending on like the light intensity around me, the color of the spot changes. Like, if I do it in the dark, then the spot is lighter than like the surrounding things. Okay. So, yeah. What, 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 what do you think of the spot in general? What, 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 uh, what colors do you? What, 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 what color do you get? Uh, so if it's like light, then I get. Oh, okay, so you're 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 seeing this as a largely black spot at the moment, okay? And but you say if you sit in the dark, it, it, you'd actually see it as light. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Uh, uh, um, black, white. Got any boats? Any people seeing? As, uh, I, I, I'm, for instance, if I look at this right now. I'm seeing a black surround with a white center, for instance. You can, you can see if you see that. Um, OK, anything else of vast interest? Yeah? Uh, if I keep my other eye open, I see two of you. 
Ah, yes, very nice. Um, so we'll call that uh, diplopia, which is just a technical term for double vision. Um, yep, that's good. Um, anything else we should add to this for the moment? All right, yeah. Push on one side, look towards that side. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, maybe there. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I can make up a story for that. Um, <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, this part, part of what's interesting here is um, that that you know th th there's kind of a rich phenomenology here, um, and th that, you know I know I know about the spot. Uh, the disappearing with eye movement piece. Um, I think I I can uh, I, I can spell um, maybe uh, disappear with eye movement. That I I I, I don't remember that one from um, previous versions. Um, all right, let's let's try explaining some of these. Um, how come you see a spot? That's, that seems fairly basic place to start, right? I've got, um, well, we, can, we can dispense with theory number one. You never knew before that you had an LED at the, in the end of your finger, right? And, and oh, you get, oh, by the way, totally cool effects um, if, you, if you have a, a little LED um, and put it up against your lid and, and wiggle it. Um, and, and you, you, you um, one of the things, what, what you will see if you do that, this, this is the homework. Um, uh, oops, can't spell that either. You will see your, uh, per, that's probably spelled wrong, uh, but your Perkinji tree, um, your Perkinji tree will look something like, uh, this with much more ramifications on it. And what you're looking at when you do that is um, the pattern of blood vessels on the top of your retina. These are the shadows cast by your um, retinal blood vessels. This spot where they all seem to be emerging is um, where the blood vessels go out of the eye as does the optic nerve. It, it's, it's a blind spot because there are no photoreceptors here. And have you, how, how many people have seen their blind spots sometime? OK, good. Glad elementary education is still doing cool things. Um, but if you do this with a, 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 um, uh, the, 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 this LED trick, you can actually you know, see where the blind spot is and put things in there and watch them disappear. It, it's, it's, it's deeply cool, but I didn't bring 100 LEDs, so we can't play with that. Um, OK, so you, you, don't, you don't have an LED in your finger. Why do you see a spot? Yeah? Uh, speculation, but maybe because like, we learned in biology like today that like, there's rods and cones that are like the photoreceptors. So like, if you're blocking the light that comes one certain way, it might cause like, part of the light to be blocked. Um, yeah, OK, so one possibility is that it's somehow bl it, it, it's blocking uh, light in, in some fashion. But if you sit, uh, well, we've already had the uh, experience of somebody who's been poking her eye in her childhood. Um, if you're in the dark and you poke your eye, you'll still see the spot. So it's not dependent on light out in the world, apparently. Yeah? Um, could it possibly disrupt the alignment between your lens and your retina to the point where light no longer focuses in a specific spot on the retina? Um, that's a cool thought, but how come it works in the dark? The, uh, th though that is, by the way, related to so the distorted blurry thing um, is probably because uh, if you see the distorted blurry piece, you're pushing hard enough to um, distort the optics of the eye enough to, uh, to, to, to blur the image in, uh, in some fashion. Yeah? Does the fact that it happens in the dark mean it has to be a mental? OK, well, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of down with the idea that everything you see is a mental thing. 
Um, that's not the technical term tech, but but yeah, that, that, yeah. But yes, okay. So it's it's created it's created in your mind in some fashion. But then, you know, uh, if you ask me, why do you see uh, you know that spot? There, you know that that there's. The, 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 that spot is also, by the time you see it, a mental thing of some variety, right? There's just a bunch of stuff on a board here. Um, OK, but it's, it, it, yes, we're definitely constructing that in the mind. How come? Any more? Yeah? So like the mechanical process that like physically stimulating the muscle. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's about, uh, that, 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 that's it. What you're doing is you're mechanically stimulating the retina, um, right? Retina. Let's make it like an eyeball here. Um, eraser, eraser. We need an eraser because I put a spot there that I don't want anymore. Um, that's your eye. Um, on the back of your eye, the 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 sheath of uh, neural tissue, including the photoreceptors that you were apparently talking about today. That's the retina from the Latin word for net. Um, and um, when you poke your eye, you are mechanically stimulating it. Um, that's creating an electrical signal. And that's going off up to the brain. Um, yeah, OK. If I mechanically stimulate my arm, um, I do not see any spots. So why is it that I'm see? Why, why, why am I doing this mental thing of deciding that, uh, that, that I'm seeing a spot. It was a great revelation in the 19th century. Yeah? No, it didn't. That's that. I like that. that. That's related to the it disappears with an eye movement thing. Now, it, it, it is certainly true under most normal circumstances, if something is poking you in the eye, it would be a really good idea to move. Um, but in this particular case, uh, I, I, I don't think that's an account of why, um, why, you're, seeing, why you're seeing light. Yeah? Is it because the simulation of the uh, receptors is what we used to see in general? Yeah, is it, so right, the, the brain up here, uh, it, it doesn't have access to capital T truth out in the world, what it has access to is whatever the, um, uh, the, the, it, its senses are telling it, right? And you come into the, so, so the, in, in the 19th century, this was known as the doctrine of labeled lines. Um, the idea is that you know, you are born knowing, essentially, that if the, if the signal is coming up the optic nerve, that's light, that's vision. I'm going to interpret that as vision. Um, you are not born to go to weird lectures where a guy says, poke yourself in the eye, and your brain, you, know, you, see you have this elaborate. I mean, oh, one of the interesting things about this is the fact that I'm up, uh, explaining this to you doesn't help. The pieces of the brain that say, if it's coming from the eye, it's, it's, it's vision, um, are what's known as cognitively impenetrable. You can talk to it all you like, and it's never going to listen to you, right? Hey, don't be stupid. That's not light. That's me being an idiot poking myself in the eye, right? Yeah, that's fine. I'm seeing light because that's the way, that's the way we're wired up. And you can do this um, if, if you... Um, uh, <laughs> if you're so inclined. Um, if you electrically stimulate your tongue, you'll taste it. It's a somewhat more complicated uh, uh, experiment because you'll also um, produce ions in your saliva that probably have some taste too. But if you do the experiment nicely in a nice controlled fashion, you'll get taste off of stimuli that have nothing to do with taste. Um, if you poke yourself in the ear, trust me, you'll hear it, but it'll be hard to hear over the sound of yourself screaming. Um, but it ba OK, so we're seeing the, the spot as light because you're stimulating um, a, a sensory surface whose job it is to sense light. Um, OK, that's cool. Uh, why is it um, on the opposite side from where you're poking it? 
what's 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 it what's it doing on the uh, on on the on the opposite side? All right, who ha oh, we, we, oh, oh, we haven't gotten him before. We'll go is blue it, tie uh, person. Yeah. Your eye over uh, overcompensating for the loss of this side, maybe. Uh. Um, okay, that's a thought that that uh, you know, this guy's wrecking this side of my eyeball, so I better see something cool um, over over there. Um, but nope, nope, nope. That, that's not going to work. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, is this kind of relating to how when light goes into your eye, it's reflected on the opposite side of like the retina, and it, like you, the eye, the image that the eye sees is like upside down from what you see, or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, so that is the, the, the right answer. So if I have a, um, an, an, typically an arrow out in the world, all the, all the classic textbooks use an arrow, when it goes through the optics of the eye, the image is painted in an inverted way on the retina. Which came as a vast surprise in, well, it came as a vast surprise multiple times. Uh, the, 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 the Arabs figured it out first, but nobody in Europe was listening. Um, but then, um, oh, who figured it out in Europe? Anyway, what they did, um, you know, how are you going to figure out what's on the back of the eye before you got good microscopes and, and, and optics and stuff like that? Well, you go to the butcher and you get yourself. Um, some cow eyeballs because, you know, frankly, nobody else wants them. Um, and you take your cow eyeball and you very carefully peel off the back layers of the eye um, so that you just have uh, like a little projection screen there. And then you show the, uh, the, the eyeball something and you find, oh my goodness, the image is, is, is upside down. Um, this, this was a matter of vast um, uh, upset for, um, well, on and off forever. You can still, if you, if you go on the web, I'm sure you can find somebody who thinks it's a really deep philosophical issue why you don't see the world um, upside down. Oh, and it did lead to one of the world's great set of experiments. What would happen if, you, if, if the world was right side up on the retina, do you think? Um, so what people did, and actually this is people who were the advisors of my doctoral advisor, was they built uh, goggles that you put in front of the eyes that inverted the image, so it re-inverted here, and, and so the upright arrow was upright on the retina. Um, and um, the, the question at that point was less what you would see. Everybody knew you'd see it upside down. The question was whether you would adapt to this and learn how to deal with it. Um, I have, I still actually have a pair of these that are, who must be, they're really old now. Um, and um, I didn't bring them, that's too bad. But, well, maybe it's not too bad. When I was teaching sensation and perception here, I, I, I showed them off. They were very cool. A guy from uh, one of the MIT fraternities thought they were so cool that he wanted to take them to a party. Um, and, and show them off, and I said, yeah, be real careful with them. They're kind of uh, fragile, yeah, 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 no problem. Puts the glasses on, walks out of my office, and um, comes back oh, about 20 minutes later. Um, he hadn't made it out of the building. <laughs> he was a becoming shade of green, um, and said, these aren't as much fun as I thought. Um, because the first thing that happens if you wear inverting goggles is you get really sick to your stomach. Um, and uh, oh, I'll put a little note here. We can come back to that. It's an interesting, that spell nausea, yeah. Well, it makes you extremely nauseous. Um, but anyway, let's go back to the, 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 the spot. Um, if I'm stimulating the retina under my finger and I'm interpreting that as light, where is that light out in the world? Right? If the image, so the, the, well, we know we know the answer from the experiment. The answer is that it's on the opposite side. Well, we we know you know we, we know phenomenal phenomenologically that it's on the other side. But why is it on the why is it on the other side? 
um, it's on the other side because just as you have a labeled line that says, if I'm stimulating the eye, that's vision, um, you have something that basically, in a sense, knows that the image is inverted and says, if I'm getting stimulation here, it must be coming from a ray going out there somewhere. And that's going to be on the other side. Down is up, up is down, um, left is right, and, and so on. So this is, this is evidence for that inverted, um, for the inverted image thing. Um, <coughs> what people worry about in a sort of a, a confused philosophical kind of way is why isn't this a problem? Um, and the answer really is the, uh, the mental stuff piece. Look, you're not seeing that image. What you're seeing is what your brain makes of it. And your brain is making its representation on a highly wrinkled cortical surface back here somewhere. Nobody sits around and says, how come the world doesn't look wrinkled behind my head? Right? It's just not a meaningful question. What you are seeing um, isn't directly the world. It's your understanding of the world. And your understanding of the world is, if I'm stimulating here, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting something uh, I'm, I'm getting something on a ray that, that projects out um, on the uh, uh, in, in, consistent with this inverting optics um, of, of the of the eyes um, all right let's let's see what else we need to talk about we said a little bit about distorted and blurry oh let's say a word about the diplopia part um, and, um, and and a related problem um, here let's let's do a Variant on um, uh, the, the the basic experiment. Uh, look at me. Maybe close one eye, um, and instead of pushing to see the spot, uh, just wiggle the eye. Yeah. Okay. What do you see? <laughs> Would you care to be more explicit? The image. The, okay. So I I look like I'm wiggling, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is funny though. You just move around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 trust me, I'm not, right? It, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to do the little wiggle dance, right? So, so it, 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 it looks like, um, like I and the rest of the world am, am wiggling around a bit. Why? That's not really hard, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we're moving the retina. Yeah, yeah, you're moving the retina, right? You're, you're actually displacing, uh, you're, you're displacing the eye. Um, if you displace the image in one eye but not in the other eye, um, now what had been uh, concordant input is a little uh, disrupted, and that's why you end up seeing two of me, possibly. But that's not the interesting part of the wiggle. Here's the interesting part of the wiggle. Um, don't poke yourself. Just uh, look at me. Um, and look from uh, the, 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 this is a, look say from one ear to the other ear, and back a couple of times. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah, not your own ear. <laughs> but there's a couple of people here who I, I can I can see your eyes. The the people whose eyes are like going all the way into the other side of their head are are, are being more more. Well, we can get to that in a minute. Um, but okay, so, so you move your eyes back and forth. Um, what happens to me? Yeah, that's exactly right. Not much, right? And and if you think about it, so so the the, the story was you wiggle your eye, um, and the world wiggles around, right? That makes obvious sense. Okay, you are making large, relatively large, saccadic ballistic eye movements four times a second all day. How come the world isn't jumping around? Right? You don't. Now, it used to be that you could um, come up, that the obvious exam, that the obvious analogy would be, if you've got a video camera and you're trying to, well, you know, that's always jiggling all over the place. And, but when you move your eyes around, things don't jiggle. Well, now you move your video camera, they fix that too. Um, but the fact remains that when you move your eyes around, the world stays stable. How does that work? Yeah? Well, 
I mean, if your brain is the one issuing instructions to move around your eyes, then it makes sense that it would be adjusting for that so you don't see it. the world so jittery. And yeah, okay, so that, that's a very nice answer. Uh, it took the field many years to get there. Um, but that's, that's basically about it. Um, when you tell, you know, when, when some chunk of your brain says, let's move the eyes from a point here to a point 10 degrees to the right, you send a copy of that signal to perceptual chunks of your brain uh, that say, everything is about to jump 10 degrees to the left, ignore that or cancel it or fix it. The details of how you do that is very tricky. And people have done, I mean, the people are still working on that. But basically, the, 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 the gist of the answer is, is right. Oh, the other thing you do is, while I'm moving the eyes, um, basically turn them off. You don't see, if, 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 I, um, if, if, if I take the world and jump it 10 degrees to the left, you'll see, um, you'll see the jump, and you'll also see the sort of smear. You don't see the smear when you move your eyes. Is, it, is that disagreement, or you're just trying to make it happen? <laughs> okay, make that. okay, so that's where we get the look from you, one of your ears to the other. Now try, apart from, mostly because it's really fun for me to watch, um, move your eyes back and forth as fast as you can. Try, try that. And if you do that, you'll notice now you're getting the blur, and now you're getting the, the jumping around, right? Basically, what you've done is you've <clears throat> exceeded the, uh, uh, the, the operating specs for the machine. It's, um, so it, it's basically saying, yeah, <laughs> I'm not built for this. You want to make a sensible eye movement, I can deal. You want to be drunk and crazy, yeah, that's your problem. Um, OK, but then why, if I wiggle my eye like this, which is actually a relatively modest wiggle compared to moving my eyes around, why does the world move? Yeah? Because your brain gives you a chance to adjust to it. Yeah, because you know, this is another cognitively impenetrable thing. You can tell your brain all you want. Hey, brain, I'm about to poke myself in the eye. That is going to move the eye. Please ignore that. The world is staying stable. Um, and it's just, uh, no. Um, there's, there, there was no reason to design that into uh, the system. The only reason um, that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the only reason for that is to you know immunize you against weird lectures in in uh, in you know sensation and perception, and that's not really worth it over the vast span of evolution or something like that. Um, or anybody else on here? Oh, disappearing with the eye movement. Um, uh, so if you, let's see, it was, if you look towards the finger, it disappears, right? Possibly. I think what's going on is you're sliding the pressure of the finger off the retina, right? The retina doesn't wrap all the way around. And if you look towards it, I think I've got the geometry right here. I think what's happening is you're no longer stimulating retina. You're just poking yourself. Um, and, and so there's, there's nothing to see. But it's a, it's a, a, nice, a nice observation. There are other cool things that you can do. Oh, I should say, um, it's important to, you know, to, to be giving you uh, a, a really useful life skills here. Um, and this turns out to actually be a useful life skill. Because if you happen to be sitting in a boring lecture, um, you can um, do these kind of demos and it looks like you're just thinking hard, right? Oh, yeah, that's kind of, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's, it's very discreet. Um, and uh, so I will leave as, as the exercise for the reader um, uh, what, what actually sounds quite dangerous but isn't. Um, if you press on your eye in a sustained kind of way, well, you can try this now if you want. Um, let's see, co cover one eye, yeah, OK. Um, I now can't see you. Um, which is kind of cool. That's called pressure blinding um, and sounds pretty dire. Um, what you're doing is you're cutting off the blood supply to the um, retina. And the retina is saying, no blood supply, no oxygen, no oxygen. We ain't doing no work here. 
um, and, and we're going to shut ourselves down because, um, you know, we don't want to die. Um, and I, I've been doing this for years. Nobody's ever gone blind <clears throat> doing that. I mean, in fact, it's an experimental technique. It's, 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 um, I'm sure you can do something stupid enough that it wouldn't be um, safe, but it's, it's basically... Um, it's basically perfectly benign and kind of fun because as you're sitting there at that boring lecture, you can make the guy disappear. Um, <laughs> the other thing, um, so it, it, it's the, um, well, you can, you can try the pressure blinding thing on your own. What you may discover depending on who you, so this, I, I claimed before that individual differences really didn't apply here. That's not true. It applies to pressure blinding. Some people can pressure blind themselves just fine. Other people will discover that um, they can never quite eliminate the center of vision. So <clears throat> at the, you've got the retina. At the back of the retina, you've got a little pit. The, um, the Latin for pit is fovea. Um, in fact, I was just in. Rome, and there's, uh, oh, Saint who? I can't remember the name of the saint, but there's a, uh, um, a church that's devoted to Saint somebody or other in Fovia, which is very exciting if you're a vision researcher, but when you go and see the paintings, you discover that the poor guy is actually in a pit, um, and he's being martyred in this pit, <laughs> but it's the same word in any case. The Fovia is um, the, uh, the, the, where when you fixate, on a particular object, that image is being formed on the fovea. It's the point of high, um, high visual resolution, and um, uh, <coughs> where photoreceptors are packed in the most closely. Everything else is squeezed out of there. And for some people, but not for everybody, there's an extra blood supply. Um, and if you pressure blind uh, yourself and you can't, and, and, and there's a preserved central field, this small central field, you probably have this extra blood supply. And good for you, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, usefully redundant. No, I mean, it, it is, you know, it, it's, why do you have two eyes? Yeah? Well, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay so that's, that's a correct answer, sort of, right? Stereoscopic depth perception based on the subtle differences between where the, the, the images in the two eyes, is abs does absolutely require um, uh, two eyes. Um, to say we need it for depth perception um, would be overstating things, because can you still see depth if you cover one eye? Do I suddenly have some, am I standing in front of the blackboard or behind it? <laughs> right? Ob look, it's, 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 so there are many, many cues to depth one of which is binocular vision, um, which only, uh, binocular so-called stereo vision or stereopsis, um, only some animals have it. Very useful for extremely fine grain um, uh, depth perception, but there's a lot of two-eyed animals that don't, uh, that, 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 that don't have um, uh, stereoscopic depth perception. Who's got stereo? No, I'm, not, I'm not asking about you personally, um, though, um, <clears throat> there will be some percentage of you, particularly if you happen to know that you had an eye that was misaligned in your childhood, um, who are so-called stereo blind and won't and won't have stereo um, stereo vision. Um, but if if you're what, what what sort of animals do you think have um, stereo vision? Yeah, yeah, we we need we need the new hands here. We we don't really need the new hands. We can go back to the old hands. All right. You're, were you an old hand? I don't even remember. Yeah. Okay, so big cats. big cats, just like you and me, right? <laughs> the, uh, um, the uh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 um, that, e even little cats. You're, you're, in, in fact, uh, um, one of the, so doing research. How, how do you find out if an animal has stereo vision? Um, you know, take, taking it to a, a production of Avatar or something and saying, Do you, doesn't that look cool? Uh, it really doesn't work. Um, so classic experiments done, oh, probably back in the 1970s um, with cats to show that they had stereo vision. Um, 
arranged for the cats up on a platform. Down here, there are two surfaces. The difference between the two surfaces is um, defined stereoscopically. Cats, uh, um, and, um, and one of those surfaces is a trap door. The cat jumps onto that, it's going down through, the, and the cat doesn't like that. And you're gonna push the poor cat off the, off the thing. And the way you find the cat has stereo vision is the cat figures out how to go to the right side um, when it's, when it's, uh, it's got to jump. Um, but anyway, cats, yes, certainly. We, we need it. Um, so here, let, let, let's elaborate on this question a bit. Um, to have stereo vision, what you need are frontal eyes, right? You need Because you need to have the two eyes overlap. Um, there are plenty of animals out there whose eyes are like much more on the side of their head who have little or no binocular overlap. So what's the difference between those two groups of, uh, of, of animals? Yeah? Uh, so that, that is probably at least one of the right answers and probably the, it's, it's the leading right answer, right? That um, who needs good depth perception and good frontal eyes. Well, if you're a pussy cat who wants to jump on that mouse, you really, really want to, you know, get, get exactly the right depth because otherwise you're not getting it. Um, if, on the other hand, you're a bunny, um, or for that matter, a cow, but let's be a bunny because bunnies are cool. Um, highly precise depth perception is not really high on your list. All you really want to know is where are my vegetables in my garden? And they're just right there under your face. Um, but what you really do want to know is who's trying to sneak up on me with their good depth perception to eat me. Um, so rabbit eyes way on the side of the head. And uh, so, so if your visual field, which you can figure out roughly by, you know, well, if you try doing this, you're going to whop your neighbor. Um, <clears throat> but um, you, you, you have a little more than 180 degrees of visual field. A rabbit has 360. Um, not only 360, it can also see, the way to think of a rabbit is like a planetarium dome with ears. <laughs> um, so it's really hard to sneak up on a bunny um, because they've got this big field, but they don't, they don't end up with, um, with binocular vision. Um, but okay, so um, that gives you a different answer to why I have two eyes. Two eyes, you can see more of the world. Um, the other answer, well, there are a bunch of answers, but another candidate answer um, is a little why, um, a, a, a little like, why do you have two kidneys? You don't have two kidneys for any, you know, binocular, by, uh, what, what, would the, what's, what would the term be? Binephrolic or something function. Um, you, you, you've got two kidneys because if you lose one, you don't die. Um, if one of them stops, um, working on you. Um, and so it may well be that another one of the pressures for having multiple um, two, or in some species, more than two eyes, um, is redundancy. Um, also, also uh, in, if you are a nocturnal animal, having two detectors pointed at something makes it more likely that you'll see it than if you have only one. So another possibility will be um, uh, in, in enhanced, enhanced <coughs> detection. Um, I don't quite remember how we got onto why you have two eyes, but I'm sure it was a fascinating um, reason. Oh, but but okay. Now that we're on to eyes, I'm definitely showing you the ugly fish, whether you want it or not, right? Can, can, can I show you? Can I show you the ugly fish? Okay, I gotta gotta show you the ugly fish because the ugly fish is new. Um, we are. Um, we are definitely not in the realm of my research here. Um, is that going to, here, let, oh, it's never going to work if we don't plug the thingy back in, right? Uh, let's see if that does anything good. Uh, okay, that looks good. There's the flash drive. Let's pull that up. All right, that. <coughs> I would argue that that's an ugly fish. Um, 
And if you, if you, if you, if you don't think that's an ugly fish, that's a seriously ugly fish. Um, my, my son is a, one of my sons is a sushi chef, um, and I don't think even he has any affection for that. Um, these guys um, are very deep ocean fish, and they're kind of cool because um, uh, it, it, it turns, well, we're not quite sure why they're cool. We are sure that... We are sure that they're. Uh, we, we're sure that they're cool. We know that they're cool because they uh, they, they they got into um, science um, uh, uh, this week. Uh, no, not this week. Couple a couple of months ago now. Um, all right. So, what did you learn about uh, rods and cones? If somebody somebody says you were learning about rods and cones today, give me give me the quick rod and cone summary. Um, yeah. Black and white, and vision and low light, and then color. Cones help you see color. Yep. So you've got. Um, if I plot, oh, go away. Um, if I plot uh, some measure of sensitivity as a function of um, wavelength from about four hundred nanometers to about 700 nanometers, um, which is the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that you call light because you can see it. Um, you, uh, you've got, oh, where is it peaking? Five something or other. You've got one rod photoreceptor. Cheap joint, no colored chalk, um, and you've got you've got three um, three cone uh, photoreceptors that we'll come to in a second. Why why um, uh, why four hundred to uh, to seven hundred nanometers? Right, we've spent you know years of technical um, work trying to you know build ourselves telescopes that can see radio waves and. Uh, see stuff into the infrared and ultraviolet and all sorts of parts that we can. Why, why did uh, nature supply us with a visual system that does 400 to 700 nanometers? Roughly. Any notion? Yeah? Yeah, the, 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 the wavelengths of, from the sun that are getting to the terrestrial surface um, are concentrated there, and there's really cool stuff happening in the radio frequencies, but not that if, you, if, if you're a bunny, you're just not that gripped by them. Um, and um, so if you're a, uh, so rods, very sensitive at low light level, um, but there's only one flavor of them, uh, with the result that, um, if I have a wavelength here or a wavelength there, I'm going to get the same response out. I can't tell the difference between that and that. If I adjust the intensity, right, I can modulate how much signal I'm getting by just turning up how many photons I'm absorbing here. Basically, this means I can't tell the uh, wavelength information with one type of, um, with one type of receptor. Um, and so at night, well, at, at, at night, if you aren't hanging around with your phone um, or you know, the bright red LEDs or whatever in, 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 the, in the clock up there or something, if you're really out, out in moonlight when you're working in so-called scotopic conditions that are just activating the rods, the world looks black and white, not because the color somehow got washed out at night, the same wavelengths are there, they're just dimmer, um, but because you only have one photoreceptor type working. Um, when you've got, uh, at, at brighter light levels, you've got three, oh, let's do it like that, that's about right. You've got three photoreceptors at play. That means you get three numbers out for every wavelength, and through a, 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 a series of interesting transformations that you're welcome 
I, you know, I, can, I can talk about for days, but I won't. Um, those three numbers are going to determine what color you see. Right? You, get, you, so you, you, you get color because you have more than one type of photoreceptor. OK. Now, fish, particularly deep fish, have rods. They don't have cones. Rods and cones, by the way, are named rods and cones because they look like rods and cones, um, sort of, mostly. Um, but they're, they're, they're morphologically different. Um, deep water fish have rods. Um, and there's not a lot of light there. And it all made sense until these guys went and looked at those really ugly fish. Actually, they looked at the genome of these really ugly fish and discovered they got genes coding for um, a whole bunch of different photopigments. So this, uh, I didn't bring the picture from the, from the article, but it basically looks like um, just bunches of them. Um, this is some fish hanging around where there's practically no light with a retina full of way more kinds of photoreceptors than you have which is weird. Um, and they're really ugly, which is great. Um, and we really don't quite know why. There are some, the, the paper makes some uh, cool speculations. One of them is, so what, what, what these, th th these guys are interested in a couple of things. They're interested in catching every photon out there, because there just aren't that many photons getting down to where these guys are hanging out. Um, so you might get some benefit by basically kind of building yourself a receptor that's highly sensitive over a wider range. Um, the, <clears throat> the explanation I like even better, though, is that uh, lots of stuff in the deep ocean emits light on its own. They signal to each other um, with, with bioluminescent um, systems, and different systems produce um, different primary wavelengths. And at least one possibility is that you've got uh, different photoreceptors for different types of um, beasts you might encounter in the deep. You know, oh, this one is, uh, is, is firing off, you know, photoreceptor 12. I like to eat those. Um, this one is firing off photoreceptor 7. Oh, that light likes to eat me. I'm getting out of here. Um, no, nobody knows if that's true, but it's a really appealing, it's a really appealing idea. Um, so I was, I was pleased when uh, <clears throat> to, plus they're really ugly. And, and, and I'm, I'm just, oh, oh, by the way, those teeth um, are the subject of a, a recent article in Science and Nature, too, because they are clear um, because of the way that they are um, built. And they're built for, apparently, incredible strength. That's, uh, um, I think, probably because it's just very, very difficult to get good dental care um, in, in the black abyss of the deep. So you might as well keep your teeth um, for as, as, as long as you can. Um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sort of thinking which direction I want to go here. We could do more. There's a couple more sea creature things that are. Do we? Uh, I'm just looking at the next picture in this particular deck, which is kind of random. Should we talk about hair cells, or should we? We could. Uh, okay, that's not a hair cell. That's just hair. Um, that's that's a hair cell, um, and this. I, I, there's a transition here because I get to talk about more cool beasts of the deep here. Um, so a hair cell is a, is a, is a sensory cell um, in, in uh, all over the place um, that is characterized by having these little cilia that if you mechanically bend them, um, it generates an electrical signal. Um, and all the action <clears throat> is in how you're going to get around to bending those, uh, bending those little hairs. Oh, it's also incredibly elegant in a, um, uh, uh, in a sort of a, uh, I don't know if it's low-tech kind of a way. The way those 
the reason why bending these guys um, uh, da, 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 generates an electrical signal is that the, the hairs on the hair cells have little teeny hairs that are attached you know, from one cilium to the other such that when you bend it, the hair on one pulls open a trap door, a molecular sized trap door on the next um, uh, cilium. An ion can flow through, and that's, it's, it's, a me it's really mechanical. It's, n it's not some fancy receptor binding thing. It's, uh, I'm being bent, oh, there's a hole in me now, and stuff's going in. It's, it's just lovely, um, beautiful. Like, do, actually, do I have a picture of that in here? That's what they really look like. That's very cute. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go, right? Yeah, so it's, it's this little teeny little hair pulling open this teeny little hole, and uh, teeny little ions are flowing through that teeny little hole, and who can believe that works? Okay, what can you use this for? If, you, if, if, I, if I gave you this device, what might you be able to, uh, to use it for, might you think? Well, I'll ask a different question. Um, how do you know which way is down? Right? If, if, I, if I said point to the way gravity is pulling, you, you, you kind of, yeah, very good, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's good, right? But how do you know that? Um, it, it, it's right, right system, wrong bit. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so inside your inner ear, do I have a picture of your, I must, this must have a picture of your inner ear somewhere. Um, oh, well, we'll worry about that in a minute. Um, inside your inner ear, you have a collection of uh, tubes in what's known as your vestibular system, vestibule from little rooms, um, and they, in various ways, have um, clusters of hair cells. The semicircular canals just mentioned, oh, come on, let's just go in, don't peek. Uh, oh, no, oh, what happened to the semicircular canals? Oh, there they are, good. There we go. The semicircular canals are canals that are roughly semicircular, hence the name. Um, so vestibular system, um, this is the auditory system in your, in your inner ear, they're, they're, and, and uh, they're closely related. Um, the semicircular canals have, they're basically a, like a, an inner tube, with a kind of a bulge, and in this bulge are a bunch of these hair cells, and this is uh, fluid filled. Um, and um, ask yourself, okay, what, what happens if, if, if I've got a, uh, a, a, a tube filled with fluid and I rotate it, what's, what's gonna happen to these hairs? Right, what, well, or, or actually more to the point, why are these hairs gonna get distorted? Um, a bit, the answer is the fluid is gonna, you're gonna move the head. Uh, the structure is rigid, but the fluid is non-rigid, of course, and so it's gonna uh, lag behind, and, and that flow is gonna distort the, um, uh, the, the hair cells. So what that's good for is um, knowing uh, not where gravity is, but knowing where, um, uh, uh, knowing what your head's doing. If you turn your head, you can, you know what's going, you do it enough, you fall over. Um, uh, you, you know what's um, changing because of the semicircular uh, canals. Um, not that any of you do this, or should, um, but if you get drunk, you get dizzy, um, why do you get, okay, let's, let's start with what you did do, which was much more fun when you were littler than it is now, and that's an interesting question in its own right. How many people remember once upon a time that it was really great 
to spin around in circles a whole bunch of times, and then you're really dizzy, and you stagger around, and yeah, 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 right? Yeah, totally awesome. Um, how many people no longer think that's as much fun as it used to be? Yeah, I'd, I'd, we don't really understand that, um, the, uh, which is it's, it's just sort of interesting. But what you're doing when you do that is you're getting the fluid in motion, and when you stop, it's still in motion, and so you feel like you're still spinning. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's great. OK, similar sorts of things happen when you're drunk. Why do they happen? Do you figure? Well, the, uh, the usual answer, OK, let's, what, do you, what you got? Yeah, so a reasonable answer would be alcohol is a poison and you're not doing yourself any favors. Um, and that's absolutely true to your brain, but that's not, it turns out, why you get dizzy. Why you get dizzy is that alcohol gets into your blood very quickly. It's lighter than water and it dilutes the endolymph. This is a very carefully calibrated system. It knows how much slosh to expect if you turn your head like this. Now, if you dilute the system, you get more slosh. You turn your head like this, the brain says, oh, it's gone all the way around. I shouldn't have done that. Um, the way that one of the proofs for this in an experiment that I think would be a little hard to do today is they gave um, observers um, heavy water, which is denser than, um, th th than regular water, but, but behaves similarly physiologically, apparently. And people got drunk, dizzy, without, of course, any alcohol being, um, being involved. Um, now, so this is, oh, and uh, let, let, let's, here, see that blob? There's another little, um, whoop, well, that's a very ugly version, but what the heck. There's a couple more little um, chambers with a bunch of hair cells in them um, that are called the utricle and the saccule, but that's not terribly critical for right now. Um, and um, the way they're structured is that the little hairs are sitting in kind of a cap of jello. And in that cap of jello are uh, otoliths, which is simply ear rocks. Um, they're, they're, they're little, uh, 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 I think it's calcite, I don't remember, but they're little rocks that are in, in there. Now, imagine that, um, imagine that I have more hair than, uh, as, as once I did, um, which actually once upon a time was nice and bushy. So you have to sort of imagine I've got a, a, a cap of hair on my head and, and, and some jello um, and some rocks. Um, what happens? if I tilt my head relative to gravity. You know, the rocks go down, the hairs get bent, and that's the signal that's telling you um, that you're um, uh, th th about the orientation of your head relative to gravity. Now, it's a little complicated. Imagine the same situation. What happens if I take off running? What do the, what do the rocks do? They lag behind, they bend the cells, and there's, there's a similar signal. Now, you are carefully designed to be able to disambiguate the um, hair cells, um, the, 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 the changes due to change in gravity versus uh, linear acceleration. But bad things happen when you do things like invent um, uh, jet airplanes. Um, so imagine you are the pilot of a jet airplane, and you are taking off um, down, the, uh, down the runway at really high speeds, and those little rocks are you know, three blocks behind, right? What's that signal telling you? What, what would normally cause... Um, uh, okay, what, what, what's the gravitational signal if... The, if, 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 if um, uh, what, what, what's the orientation of your head if the, if the rocks are back there somewhere? <laughs> right, got to be doing something like this, right? So as you accelerate, um, 
you, your senses will tell you, I'm pulling up. If you were not listening in flight school where they said, do not pay attention to your senses, pay attention to your instruments, what are you going to do if you're pulling up too fast? You're going to level off. But if the pulling up is an illusion, what happens when you level off? <laughs> and, and apparently, this uh, early on, um, that was a uh, applied sensation and perception uh, phenomenon that was uh, um, discovered, <clears throat> discovered the hard way. Um, so now, if we go backwards, so where, where did these things come from? Um, in, if we go, where am I? Let's go back. Oh, yeah, they're really more ugly fish. Good fish. There we go. OK. Um, once upon a time, we were hanging out in, uh, uh, in, in the water. At least we were if we were crayfish. Oh, I, I was talking to a class in, in, uh, um, in Germany, and I had to. I figured nobody would have any idea what a crayfish was. Um, but everybody would, of course, know what a flush crab was. Um, which is the German word for the same thing. Um, so a crayfish and, and crustaceans in general have um, an organ called a statocyst, which is basically a very close relation to this thing. It's a chamber ringed around with hair cells. The only thing is that it's open to the water. Um, and um, it's got rocks in it, but it's got rocks in it that the crayfish puts in itself. So the crayfish is marching around, and you know it, it knows I got this hole in my head, and I got to put rocks in it. <laughs> um, and just think about what happens then as the crayfish changes the orientation of his head relative to gravity, or his body relative to gravity. The rocks are rattling around, and they're basically telling him which way is down. This was. Um, it was proven that that's what this was doing in a, uh, uh, a lovely experiment back in the 1920s, where a guy named Carmichael goes and takes some, takes some crayfish, puts them in a tank, takes out all the pebbles, puts in iron filings. OK, crayfish doesn't know from iron filing. All right, it's good enough. I'm loading my head up with this stuff. And then he takes a magnet. Um, and you know, obviously, it's not like a magnet's going to yank the, the crayfish's head over to the, the wall, but, but it's going um, to change where those um, filings go. And the, you, you basically, you know, the crayfish is like hanging out, oh, going up. I don't know why, man. It weird looks, world looks weird here. But um, so it, if, if you want to mess with a crayfish, um, you can do that. Um, <laughs> Now, the, so if you, that is pretty clearly related to this. Related to this tube is something that you may have noticed on your average fish. Many fish have a line down the side, um, and that's actually a sense organ. It's called a lateral line organ, with a very imaginative name, because it's <laughs> lateral and it's a line. Um, and if you look at it, is this a picture? Yeah, that's a picture. If you look at it, it's a tube um, like this. But like that statocyst in the um, <clears throat> crayfish, it's open to the water. Um, and it's full of um, uh, little uh, blobs that are filled with hair cells. Um, and when water flows over them, the hair cells bend, and there's a sensory signal. That's a really cool sensory signal. Um, if you're a fish, it's not so useful for you and me, because when we you know, come up on land, all the water flows out, and nothing good happens. Um, but if you're a fish, so imagine that you're just swimming along. You've got um, equal signals going down uh, both sides of your body. Suppose all of a sudden you don't have equal signals going down both sides of your body. That there's a, there's, there's a disruption of the force on uh, maybe a great disruption of the force. 
um, on, on one side of your body. What does that mean? Well, like a lot of sensory signals, it's ambiguous, but yeah? Maybe there's another fish coming to eat you. Yeah, maybe there's another fish coming to eat you. Or alternatively, maybe there's another fish that you can eat. Or maybe there's just a rock. But in any case, <clears throat> it's, telling you, it's telling you that there's something over there. And that's kind, of, um, uh, that's kind of useful, particularly if you're hanging out in muddy water. Um, because uh, because you can't, your, your visual system isn't going to be that <clears throat> useful if you're in, in, in cloudy water. And this is, the, the, this is very useful. You can also use this for schooling. If you're um, you know, trying to stay with the crowd, you should know how your neighbors are kind of feeling, not, not in a, 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 an emotional kind of a way, but you know, are, are they in, in your neighborhood? So it's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's a sensory organ that you don't have, clearly related to ones that you do have. Oh, and under the heading of things that you don't have, um, this, is, this is Ugly Fish Night. Anybody know who he is? Yeah, he's an eel. This is, that, this is an electric eel. Um, those suckers are ugly too. Um, is it a, oh yeah, and, or a zitteral if you want to do it in German. Um, so um, if you spend a lot of time watching, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, National Geographic specials or whatever, um, or no doubt these days YouTube videos about electric um, fish, uh, you you. you you know, mostly you're going to see these really cool things where the electric eel fights the uh, alligator or something. Have you seen that one? This great footage of an electric eel and an alligator, and the alligator comes staggering out of the water looking like, what the heck was that? Um, but in fact, um, mostly... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this, this is not an electric eel. That's just a platypus. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and it turns out that you can tweak your basic hair cell design and get something that will detect an electrical field. Um, and platypuses do that in their little snouts. And yeah, that's all very lovely. That's not the picture I want. Oh, there we go. Um, so it turns out that most electric fish are not using that electricity to cook anything alligators or otherwise, um, they're, they're using it <clears throat> for one of two for purposes, as it says right here, um, localization or, or, or for communication. Um, the communication thing is basically like fireflies. You know, you, you're, the, the fi fireflies is busy flashing its little rear end basically to declare how sexy it is and how interested you, the I, 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 males flash and females, which way does it go, I don't remember. Anyway, and, uh, what, what? Females are in the grass. Who's, who's? If that, or the female, anyway, somebody's flashing and, 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 and somebody's looking and, 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 and then they're the nasty ones who are, oh, I get, yeah, I, I think that's right. I think it's the females who are trying to lure the males um, saying, here I am, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a possible mate, unless it turns out that what I really am is a really nasty mimic who, when you come down thinking it's date night, it, it turns out that you're dinner. Um, but that's more or less what, they, what, what some fish are doing there. Again, very useful in murky water. How are you going to find the love of your life in a muddy stream? Well, one way is if you're, you're, you're broadcasting. Um, and, and so one thing to do is to uh, sit there and pulse an electrical signal and, and, and wait for love to show up. Um, you also, if you generate an electrical field around you and you have your own set of hair cells, um, you, can, um, uh, you can, again, dis detect disruptions in the force. And uh, again, very useful for figuring out where <coughs> other um, odd, odd, you know, objects, other fish or whatever are hanging around in your, uh, in your vicinity. So this is a sense you don't have at all. Right. It, it, here we've got the, the, the lateral line stuff adapting to terrestrial life. We just did not bring an electrical, um, an electrical sense with us. Oh, a different one um, 
that uh, continues to be a subject of debate um, is whether or not we brought a magnetic sense with us. A lot of animals are sensitive to magnetic fields. Gee, how would you make yourself a magnetic detector, knowing what you know now about, let's say, hair cells? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just take out the, if that's calcite or whatever it is, take out those rocks, put in iron in some fashion, and bingo, you've got some variety of a magnetic detector. And, and um, it's been surprisingly hard to prove this in some animals that very clearly have magnetic senses, like, like birds. But there, there, there's, there's magnetite in bird beaks and things like that, that that people suspect must have something to do with the way mag uh, magnetic sense works in birds. Birds, very good at this. You, you can... Uh, um, you can do weird experiments like uh, strapping um, a, a magnets to the side of a bird's head, um, and it confuses them. Um, and um, there have been multiple reports over the years of human magnetic sense, but they haven't held up, mostly. Um, it, it, it does, if, if you've got a magnetic sense, it's very minimal and, and, and yeah, you, you're not going to find your way. You, you don't lose your phone. Um, <laughs> you're not going to find your way home with, uh, with, with, with your magnetic sense. But uh, the world is full of animals, even down to the level of bacteria with a magnetic, uh, a functional magnetic sense. Why do you want a magnetic sense if you're a bacterium? What in the world good would that be? Well, some single-celled organisms, um, I guess down to the level of bacteria. Anyway, what they want to do is their goal in life is to get down into the muck. If you're going to do that, you got to know which direction is down. Um, how do you know which direction is down? Well, if you follow the magnetic um, field in the right direction, you're headed down, or at least down enough that it'll work. How do you know that that's what they're doing? Well, if you take your goop from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, now the lines are running the other way, right? They're going like this. The magnetic force field lines are, are, are running. And if you take it to the equator, they got no idea what to do, it turns out. But um, uh, the, the poor little um, uh, single-celled beasties are going the wrong direction if you take them to the wrong hemisphere, which is why they like almost never go on cruises. The, um, the, oh, this is, this is what happens when you throw a whole bunch of slides into, uh, um, uh, together and then decide to free associate. Um, so we've already talked about the fact that uh, um, you don't have an electrical sense. There are some cases where you have uh, similar senses to uh, another animal, in this case a fish, but it's working in a very different kind of way. See all those dots? Those are the taste buds of, of a catfish. The, the animal is basically a giant tongue. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 and I should say that's another modified hair. Is that the next, is that the picture here? Yeah, it's another modified hair cell. In this, in this case, it's not going by um, bending the cells, but the, the, the cilia now have been modified to have receptors on them for specific, um, for, uh, for specific ions or molecules. And that's the basis, the physiological basis for taste. We could do, oh, what happened here? Ah, why is it going? Oh, because I'm pushing the wrong button. Back to that fish. Um, but your, your taste buds are on your, your tongue and a few other places in your mouth. Um, you know, if you dive into a bowl of ice cream, uh, well, you'll get cold and kind of sticky probably, but nothing uh, tasty will happen, uh, certainly not to the ice cream. Um, but you, if you think about it, a catfish is like a bottom-dwelling, garbage-eating, scurvy kind of a fish. You know, how, do you, how do you find what you're looking for? You're basically, in, in murky water again, you're basically looking for uh, kind of disgusting, decaying stuff. And what better way to 
find that than to be a giant tongue and wander through uh, through the world like that. Um, I, 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 it's not anything I particularly aspire to myself, um, but it, it apparently works for you if you are a, a catfish. Smell is another set of hair cells. Um, again, finding specific receptors, um, you know, it would be, you know, specific molecules binding to those hairs rather than, than bending them. The one, the, well, the, the two sensory systems that are not hair cells, vision, those, those aren't really, those sensory cells aren't hair cells. And skin, where you've actually got the hair, oh, not hair cells. Um, but you can do cool things with, uh, so you, you've got a whole set of specialized receptors um, under your skin that are specialized for, say, um, uh, uh, pain or touch, light touch or temperature. And if you take a, a small, take like a, a, a small nail um, and uh, either heat it up or cool it down and probe on your, your skin, you'll find that there are some places where you get a little flare of sensation from cold and some where you get hot and others where you get nothing. Um, you, you can sort of map it out across, your, uh, ac across the skin surface. Um, I had an a old professor when I was an undergrad who had done some of the seminal work on this. Um, and part of the way to prove that these were, it, it wasn't just dumb luck or, or random variation was he had a tattooed grid on his arm so that he could go back and revisit um, specific, uh, specific spots. Because um, people used to do weird things. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, uh, um, I am, oh, I am aware, particularly if I look at my computer, um, of the passage of time. <coughs> so I think what I will do is I will entertain uh, questions. They can be questions about what we were talking about. They can be questions about pretty much anything in attention and vision and attention, which I actually know something about. Um, and I did spend 25 years teaching intro psych, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a bad bet for you know, sort of psych cognition questions uh, in, in, in general. But uh, um, what do you got out there? What, what, what should you uh, So um, in, the, in the eye, basically the, the inverted image of what actually there, like the retina. Yeah. And then the brain basically processes that and inverts itself. So was that always like that? Or did, is there an evolution or adaptation, adaptation that inverted? Well, you don't have to re-invert it, right? That, that's the important point, is you don't have to re-invert it. You, you, you have to interpret it. You just have to. Um, the, um, there are, is it octopus? There are optical, the, the, the study of, of, of the optics of animal eyes is a fascinating um, business um, because there are huge variations in the way that you solve the problem of how to see stuff. I think octopuses have a big eye that does not invert, is my vague recollection, though I'm not sure I believe myself as I'm saying that. But there are, there, are, there are certainly, well, insect eyes don't invert, right? They, they, they've got these, these facets um, that are each collecting. Um, and and, and the, the, it, so it's not that during evolution somehow, um, you know, it, it certainly is not the case that, you know, back in ancient Babylonia or in the Yellow River or something like that, the image was not inverted and one day it got flipped upside down and we spent you know, a few hundred years walking up. That's only in Australia, actually, where the image is. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, basically, no, this, this, the inverted image came with building this kind of optics. And um, the brain said, OK, this is what you're giving me. Um, it turns out that every time I uh, get something from over here, uh, the, 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 if I act over there, uh, I'd, you know, every, every, every time, if, 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 if I'm a, frogs, yeah, frogs have the same kind of optics. Um, if, if I get a little black spot here, if I stick my tongue out that direction, I get a fly. If I stick my tongue out that direction, I get nothing. Um, I mean, this is not really how it would work, but 
So I have come to the conclusion that if I'm stimulating over here, it's over there. Um, oh, by the way, back to the stereo vision thing. Um, so differences in the image are one way to, to, to get fine stereo vision, if you're uh, or fine resolution depth perception. Another way is to triangulate. If you think about it, imagine you've got, um, if, if you were holding two sticks, the angle uh, that you've got the sticks um, is going to tell you um, how far away the crossing point is, right? Yeah, 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 okay, that makes sense. Well, okay, now imagine that the, your visual rays, if you like, um, the, 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 the point of regard are these two sticks. Um, if you know the angle of your eye, you know something about how far, and, and, and you, uh, you, you point both eyes at the same object, right? If I point both eyes at that object, I gotta really cross my eyes. Back out there, I've got them out like that. If I can read that angle, um, I know something about, I know something quite precise about depth. Um, you and I can do that to some extent. Chameleons, <clears throat> for example, are really great at that. Um, chameleons uh, who are sitting there sticking out the really long tongue, grabbing the fly, you really got to know what depth it's at. The way they're doing that is triangulating. And the way it got proven that that's what they were doing, you put a little prism on the front of the eye to confuse the poor little chameleon. Now the chameleon thinks the fly is here, but it's really here. And you take these great slow-mo pictures of the tongue going to the wrong distance. <laughs> uh, yeah? So like, how does that type of depth perception work when you watch like a, like a video on a two-dimensional screen? Oh, it, 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 on, well, OK, so are you talking about how does it work when you're paying the big money to, to put on the fancy glasses? Are you talking about when you're just watching a regular? Yeah, well, there's, there's this huge set of um, cues to, uh, to depth that, that are so-called monocular cues to depth, right? Close one eye, and you know all sorts of things about uh, depth without stereo. So for example, as I'm looking at you, um, I, I'm looking at a texture of heads, um, and um, higher in the field, if I'm thinking about the two-dimensional plane that I'm looking at, higher in the field, the heads are smaller than they are here. Right? So if I, <clears throat> we measure things in, in vision in degrees of visual angle, not in linear distance, right? 360 degrees around your head. A, one degree of visual angle is roughly a thumb at arm's length. This woman in the front row is about a two and a half degree head. Um, that guy in the back row is about a half degree head. So I could make a variety of different assumptions. One possibility is the pinheads all sat in the back. <laughs> um, a more reasonable assumption is, oh, if, the, if, if a set of objects that are otherwise apparently in the same class are changing in size in a systematic way, that texture is telling me something about depth, right? I conclude that that person is further away than, than, um, than this person. Not only that, I kind of think that he's a whole person. Now, I can't actually see more than the upper part of his torso. Um, but I'm guessing that large chunks of him are being occluded by other things. Well, if they're being occluded, the, the occluders must be in front of the occluded. So occlusion is a very powerful um, uh, clue to depth. Um, linear perspective, which your art history ta uh, um, class told you was discovered in the Renaissance. Um, is uh, a very powerful, that's you know, the railroad tracks going off to infinity thing. Um, what the Renaissance figured out was, hey, we can paint that. Um, that the, the, the same cat who you're pushing off the, the cliff knows all about it, um, just doesn't paint anywhere near as well. Um, so that geometry is uh, occluded that shadows are, um, uh, so if you think about, if, if you look at my face or if I'm looking at your faces, um, the the self-shadowing of an object tells you uh, something about the shape of that surface. So this very large set of cues that um, that tells you about um, uh, about depth. 
and then you're willing to do all sorts of extra work by the time you've got, uh, you're projecting it onto a two-dimensional screen. It doesn't really matter where you sit in the movie theater, except that your neck gets sore. If you think about the projection onto your retina, if you're sitting way over there versus dead center versus way out in the back, there's a lot of stuff that you're compensating for that, you know, doesn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really bother you much. Now, you, you, you can make things more realistic if you compensate, if, if, if you build that into your Oculus headset and stuff like that, but, but you're, you're, you're willing to make some pretty comprehensive guesses about the way the world is put together based on a set of cues. Um, there was a, uh, yeah, so one more question. <laughs> what are we supposed to be out of here for? The room reservation. Somebody else is sleeping here tonight? <laughs> I thought we had this joint only. I know, okay. Um, well, all right. Uh, one, one more question should go to a person who has not asked a question. So if you're a person who has asked a question already or given an answer, be polite and make your hand go away. Uh, okay, you win. Unless you're an evil person who was lying. <laughs> okay. Okay. Not yours and mine, <laughs> um, but but absolutely. If you're a uh, a rodent, uh, rodents, um, it's a lot of beautiful um, neuroscience done on that system, because um, so <clears throat> the visual world is laid out in a nice topographic way across the back of um, your uh, your head. Of your, of, your, of your visual cortex, a nice map of the world, and, and there, you've got maps of auditory space and stuff like that. If you were a rodent, um, you would have uh, what are so-called barrel fields, which is a map of your whiskers, um, where each whisker has its own little devoted set of cells. And um, absolutely, what you are doing is using those whiskers to figure out um, things like, can I get into this hole? Um, I, th I think there was something about that the extent of, of, of a rodent's whiskers and the, the size of its body are importantly related, which probably makes sense anyway, right? I mean, what's the point of having whiskers like way out there if you're <laughs> just gonna start tripping on your whiskers? Um, uh, th th this, is, this is another set of, of, of I, so, so <clears throat> you have, um, it's, it's not even the same system, but you, you, you've got a, a sort of a hint about what this might be like because wrapped around the shaft of each um, hair on, on uh, whatever part of you is hairy um, and um, uh, you, you have nerve fibers that are very sensitive to um, very light touch. Um, and things like that, but but uh, if, you, if you're a rodent, it's a much more elaborated um, and very cool to study if you're into whiskers kind of a system. None of this, I should say, has squat to do with what I do for a living these days. I mean, I love this stuff. I, 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 I uh, uh, am the lead author on a sensation and perception text. I can talk about this all night, which is pretty obvious at this point, right? Um, <clears throat> What I actually work on is, is visual attention, how you, very much how you find what you're looking for and how you deal with the fact that there's way too much stimulation for you to <coughs> fully process. Um, but if you, uh, if you wanna know anything about that, you're gonna have to wait till later in the month when you can ask um, any of the three people from RSI who will be in my lab this summer. And we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing them because they're going to know all sorts of cool things about that. You should ask them. If, you, if you're totally impatient, you just talk to River, who was in my lab four years ago. Um, but, uh, but, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't know the new cool stuff. So Anyway, if we, if we, if we got to go, we got to go. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>